had a lot of visitations from my good old friend at the California Highway Patrol. <laughs> and everywhere I went, they were there ready to greet me. Because when I arrived here, I was just in awe by the long open roads that moved from Brooklyn, New York to Colinga, California. Anyone know where Colinga is? If you pass by I-5, you know you're there when you roll your windows down. When you smell cows, you're in Colinga. But beyond the smell, what is there is a huge open road. And in New York City, you don't have that luxury. And in New York City, police are so busy, so crowded, they rarely do traffic violations. So when I was here, I uh, bought myself a Jetta, a Volkswagen Jetta, which I loved, and that thing was a great car. My first German-made car. So I was like, that was my Mercedes, right? It was used, it was old, but it was my Mercedes. And I loved that car. But the CHP had a problem with me because I was going too fast to see the speed limits. And I must have spent like $1,500, if not more, on speeding tickets in the first few months that I was here. And the last ticket I received, by God's grace, I said to the officer, I said, listen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. The thing is, is that, you know, I'm new here from New York, and I'm not used to you guys doing your job, and you try to butter them up. And, you know, if you give me some grace, I'd be great. And he's like, well, welcome to California, and he had me my ticket. And so I was like, man, I gotta do something about this. So I ran down the Best Buy, and I bought myself a radar detector. <laughs> now I said, who's watching who? And so I was telling one of my friends, and she was like, Dennis, why are you doing that? And I said, like, I go, because I can't afford these tickets anymore. And so she gave me a, a parable. She said, you know, Dennis, there's a story about a guy who came to church one day, and he had this device around his neck. And as he got close to the church, it would start to beep and beep. And the, when he got closer to the pastor, it beeped even louder. And so someone asked him, you know, what's this thing you wear around your neck? And he said, oh, this is, this is my, uh, my behavior device. So whenever, whenever I'm around town, I want to make sure that I don't, I'm not a, a bad witness to the Lord, so if there's any Christians, or especially the deacons or the elders of the church, and especially the pastor, if he's anywhere near my vicinity, it starts beeping. So I get my act together. And so she's telling me this story, and I'm like, are you making this up? She's like, yes. It's exactly what you're doing with your radar detector. And I was like, okay, you got me. I get it. Just because the police aren't around, I should still obey the traffic laws. Amen? The radar device isn't going to change anything in my heart. Amen? The point of the, the issue was, she was rebuking me gently, and I love her for that. She said, Dennis, if your real solution to your traffic problems, your traffic woes, are not that there's too many police, it's that you don't want to obey the laws. And I think that's a pretty good assessment, amen? Yes. And this is what Jesus is addressing in Matthew chapter 5. When he said that your righteousness needs to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. We're going to start our Bibles there as we continue this revolutionary message that Jesus has given. Now he's getting into the meat, he's getting into the heart of this new walk with God. So when you're there, let me hear it. Amen. amen. Matthew 5, verse 20 says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you, uh, said to the people long ago, do not murder, do not, uh, and do not, I'm oh, sorry, let me read it from my Bible, because my notes are backwards. Verse 20. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said of those, of those of old you should not murder, and whoever murders will be liable for judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to hell, to hell, to hellfire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, and go first and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. 
Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going uh, with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members in your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right eye and or right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members and for your whole body to go to hell. Jesus is beginning to deal with something difficult. He says to them a twofold problem we kind of hit on last week or a few weeks ago. That their righteousness had to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, but that was hard even to hear in those days. Because a scribe was a person who spent most of his time writing by hand the laws of God. A Pharisee is one who actually separated themselves from the community in order to maintain a level of righteousness that, sur that surpassed the common people. And so when the common people looked at the scribes and the Pharisees, they looked at people of high religious honor and dignity. And they said, how can we be righteous and more holier than them? Even Paul said in Philippians 3, 5, talking about his level of Pharise of uh, righteousness in the Pharisees' eyes, he said, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, of a, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. He prided in his level of righteousness before he knew Jesus. So, in keeping the law, they found that righteousness, better Jesus is teaching a new way of life. Amen. His Beatitudes contradicted the, the norm of the religious day. When he said things that, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The, the Pharisee looked at their spiritual, the people who were poor as spiritually deficient. And Jesus would say, no, blessed are those who are poor in spirit because they recognize their absolute poverty of righteousness and need of God's righteousness. Amen? Amen. So we need to wrestle with this. Jesus is saying that the righteousness of the legalist cannot qualify you to praise heaven. God. That's hard. We say praise God. We say praise God. That's good news. But it's so hard not just to behave, but to really change. We are good behaviors, especially us Latin folks, because we learn quickly when we're little. If you don't behave, mama's going to get you. Amen? And so we apply this to every aspect of our lives, that all I need to do is behave. But listen, folks, God doesn't want people who just behave. He wants people who are transformed, what do you say? He wants people who know the power of God and live by His grace. So let's turn with me to Luke chapter 16. And Jesus here is addressing some of these external issues. And in Luke 16, Jesus is talking about a parable of the unjust steward and the worldly dilemma that they're, that they're having. And look at one of the Pharisees' response in verse 14. They always focused on the outside. Verse 14, the Bible says, The Pharisee who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your what, friends? Your hearts. Your hearts. What is highly valued among men, I love this, is detestable, my Bible says. What does yours say? Abomination. An abomination. Is an abomination or detestable in God's sight. Now let's take us soak in for a second. We work so hard to be praised and revered and honored among men. But Jesus says, be careful because those things are the things that are detestable. An abomination in the eyes of God. Men can only judge the outwardness. And he said to them, those of you who 
justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. Let me give you another passage. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23. And Jesus spends all of Matthew 23 addressing this in the lives of the Pharisees. But we're only going to address a few verses, 1 through 5 and 27 and 28. So he has this crowd of people. Remember, Jesus is confronting the main idea of righteousness in his day. And I, I argue today with you that we need to confront the main idea of righteousness of our day. Because while we have many churches today, we're not seeing the power of God the way we should. So we have to conclude that there's something wrong with the application of the message of Jesus. So Jesus addresses it here, and he says in verse 1, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, he was talking to a mixed group there, he says, Teachers of the law of the Pharisees, sit in Moses' seat. And two groups of people there. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their, their prayers wide and their tassels on their garments long and so on and so on. Notice that Jesus says, listen to what they say, but don't do what they do. Notice, when Jesus came, he never said that the Pharisees had the false message. But he was saying that they were not living up to that message. Remember last week we studied how Jesus didn't come to do away with the law, but to what? To fulfill the law. In other words, Jesus' message was in perfect harmony with the Old Testament. And what he's saying to them, that their message was not in harmony with the will of God. So he says, do what they say, but don't do what they do. He goes on to say, verse 27, Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you what? Hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones. And everything is unclean. But Jesus would say today, you guys are like caskets. Verse 28, in the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy, and wickedness. Verse 23, Matthew 23, Woe to you teachers of the law, Pharisees, hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spice and mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. They were concerned about the outwardness their self-righteousness. Jesus was calling them out because on the inside, they were wicked. You see, friends, I believe we're going to see a powerful move in God's house when we pay less attention on what's on the outside and we focus on what's on the inside. So let's be real. If we got frustrated this morning as we made our way to church because we're running late or our clothes aren't to par. If we spent more time combing our hair this morning to come to church instead of saying, God, speak to me today. God, I need to hear your voice today. God, how can I be of a servant to you today? We are on Pharisee Trail. So you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We need to look at the heart of the issue. In Matthew 15, he goes on, he goes on, he says to them, Matthew 15, 1 through 9, also addressing the Pharisees and their outward righteousness that they are so focused on. Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9, we there, let me hear an amen. amen. They had made so many substitutes, man-made commandments to maintain their religion. They had 
365 prohibitions. In other words, one prohibition for every day of the year. And look what Christ said about these laws in order to maintain their righteousness. And some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. And Jesus replied, why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God has said, honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received for me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Goodness. You see, the Jews had a, a, a tradition, a Corbin law, they called it. And if anyone was dedicate something to them, it could only be used for them. They're prophets. So for example, many of these Pharisees had family members and parents who were suffering in poverty. And these Pharisees were rich and wealthy and powerful. And when their mother and father would say, Son, can you give me a loaf of bread? They would say to those starving parents, Sorry, I can't help you. This delicious, warm bread was given to me to be used by God. So therefore, I cannot share it with you. So in the name of God, they would fill their bellies while their own parents were starving to death. Do you hear what I'm saying? And Jesus is rebuking this type of religion. This tradition of men that they had had, they had made all kinds of loopholes and the commandments that they would find. The Bible says that the, the Sabbath shouldn't be made a burden. And in Jerusalem, a lot of the roofs are flat. So on Sabbath evening, they would spend most of the evenings on the rooftops. But to lift a ladder to get to the roof would be a burden. So what they would do is they would drive the ladder as long as some of the ladder was touching the earth, it was not a burden. I told you a story when I was in New York. I was walking home on a Friday night from a Bible study and some, a Jewish Orthodox man came out of his home and said, please, will you, I'll give you a cord if you turn my heater on. <laughs> of another member of the church, his neighbor was a Jewish man and he was outside on Friday evening, standing there. And then my neighbor was on his body. He said, hey, you know, why don't you ring the doorbell and your wife will let you in. And he said, I can't ring the doorbell. It's a Sabbath. <laughs> True story. They had all kinds of loopholes. They won't travel more than a half a mile unless there's a glass of water. So they would say, if, if I drink a glass of water, now I can go another, another half a mile. You walk down Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn, you'll see all kinds of burnt bread and styrofoam or, or, or uh, aluminum foil along the streets. And people, why is that? Because from there on, I can go another two miles. Certain days of the year, the rabbi would come and rope off a whole section, two or three blocks. And within that section that's been blessed or made kosher, it's not the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. They made all kinds of laws and traditions for their own profit. Because again, their walk with God was only for them. You hypocrites, he said. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people are me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And we, 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 we hear these things and we say, oh, these guys are crazy. But careful because we do the same thing. Yes, we do it all the time. People get all caught up. Instead of re rejoicing about the Sabbath, we reluctantly turn the TV off. Amen? We say we love the Sabbath, but we are deep down bothered that all the sales on Macy's happen on the Sabbath. We get irritated that on the way to church we pass by three to five yard sales. And we say, I can't because I'm a righteous at this. Man, I tell you what, one man came to a preacher one day at a camp meeting and he says, Preacher, 
I haven't sinned in two years. The preacher looked at the man's wife. And she didn't even look up. Which said it all. Amen. It's a constant contrast of legalistic righteousness, the true Christianity that, that Christ ascribed to the Beatitudes completely contradicts them. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, Timothy writes, The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. He's a trustworthy, here is a trustworthy Savior that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the chief, or I am the worst, the Bible says. Amen? For I tell you, Jesus says, your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of these Pharisees. Verses 21 to 28, Jesus is expounding on that. He says, you say, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you say to your brother, oh fool, a raka, you are already guilty of judgment. That you say that you should not commit adultery. But I say, whoever looks onto a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her where? In his heart. He's rebuking these outward practices that they have. So here's the difference. From the point of view, these Pharisees had not killed anyone. They were correct. But in God's eyes, they were murderers because they hated the Samaritans. Some of them could say, yes, I haven't slept with a woman who's not my wife, but God knew that inside, many of them were guilty of the lust of the flesh. So this brings me a very important question. Every single one of us is tempted. Am I correct? Yes. But when does temptation become sin? Is temptation sin, yes or no? No, no temptation is not sin. Otherwise, Christ would have been a sinner because he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Amen? So let me give you an illustration. I was driving down to Fresno for one of those workers' meetings that we love so much. And on my way there, I need some gas in my car, so I pull over to get some gas, and I go to pay for my gas, and I'm dying thirsty. And the guy says, sorry, man, all we have is Coors beers. And I'm like, well, I mean, we're like in the middle, you know, you, you drive from here to Fresno, you know there's like nothing there. Right? I'm like, oh, there's no one here. All right, it's, it's nice and cold, you know, sweating on the outside. <laughs> you see all the commercials, it must be refreshing. <laughs> so I start making my way to the cooler. And as I go to pick that bad boy up, I see my fellow pastor pulling in. <laughs> and I quickly say, woo! and I walk out and I say, thank you, Lord, that I was spared that sin. Question, did I sin or not? Yes, yes I did. Because had that brother not come, I would have been drinking and driving. I already drank it in my heart. Yes or no? You see, my friends, sin, temptation becomes sin at conception. But not when it comes. Sin is like birth. When does life become life? At birth or at conception? At conception. We're tempted all the time. But the moment we act on that, either in our hearts or by action, it becomes. And James puts it this way in James 1.14. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. We all have a natural desire to sin. If the devil wasn't around, we would sin all by ourselves. That's how sinful we are. But our sin is not the result of temptation. Our sin is the result of our choices in our actions. Sin is the fruit of conception. So, the Pharisees begin with an act that Christ says, No, if you hate somebody, your heart... Without cause, you have already killed him. That was hard for the Pharisees to understand. They were planning to kill Jesus as 
they sat here and accused him of his unrighteousness. Here they are calling Jesus out because his disciples hadn't washed their hands while they're planning his murder. They were so righteous that they couldn't see their own wickedness. And the reason they couldn't see their own wickedness is because their eyes were focused on everyone else's wickedness. Do you hear what I said? Yes. See, you cannot ignore your wickedness when your eyes are focused on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Because when you look at Jesus and His majesty and His grace, you can't help but say, Lord, help me. And the beauty of Christianity isn't that Christ just simply reveals our wickedness, but that He covers our wickedness with His righteousness. Amen. But as we keep our eyes focused on others, like Mark Finley says, when you look at others, you're either being incredibly prideful or incredibly depressed. So my friends, the message of Jesus It has to be a matter of the heart. One theologian said, God gave the law to sinful human beings to drive us to Christ. And once we come to Christ and find peace and hope and assurance and justification, then Christ sends us back to the law and says, this is how I want you to live. The law was never given as a method of salvation, but the law is a standard for Christian living. God wants to transform the inner man. And then outwardly, things begin to change. If you're driving down the road, and your check engine light comes on, you don't start hitting your dashboard. Amen? It's just a symbol that something is wrong with the engine. Amen? So we have to look at ourselves and see what symbols our dashboards are telling us. Our friend who was giving Bible studies to a man in prison, and he would go every week faithfully to share with him the good news of Jesus. They were studying the book of Romans, and after they had studied the book of Romans, one of the inmates wrote to him on how that study had changed his life. I want to read to you his letter. His prayer, he writes, he says, Dear Father, help me to discern who I should accept as a friend, who I should consider as an acquaintance, and who I should, well, this is a man in prison locked up for the rest of his life. He says, let my company be a blessing to others and lead me to all your ways. Father, open my eyes to the dangers and lead me in a way that I might combat them. I need to approach you with an anticipation as I focus on you. Father, soften our hearts and the words of our mouth and let me be a peacemaker. Let the words of my mouth spread comfort and calm and make any action a testimony of your great love. Father, sometimes I feel I just can't go on. Please fill me with the strength I need, both of body and of character. Don't let me give up, but deliver me. Plead my cause, Lord, with those that I, stri that I strive with. All day I need to seek after you and make you my focus. Then the walk I walk, the talk I talk, and the life I live, and the prayers I pray as you would have me. Help me to understand how to care for the people. And Lord, teach me love. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. What a powerful prayer. How his words show where his heart really is. So many people come to this, this walk with Jesus with an anticipation of, of how God expects them to change. What they need to change in life. And let me tell you something. God changes you, amen. Amen. God transforms us, amen? But it's not because of what I've done. It's because of what He is doing. God transforms the lives of people.
But we need to understand, we can't get comfortable thinking that the church or the religion is what changes us. It's only the power of Jesus. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. I want to read it together with you. Romans chapter 6. Paul is a man who understood this battle very well. We'll start reading here in verse 1. Paul wrestled with these things because he understood that all his righteousness that he had was nothing. And everything he had gained is because of what Jesus had done for him. So he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in the resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And I love this stuff. This is where the power lies. So many of us are so tired of trying to live this Christian life. If you are tired to live the Christian life, you're not living the Christian life. You're living a Pharisee's life. If it is exhausting to come to church, you are not living the Christian life. You're living the Adventist life. If you are tired of trying to maintain a glorious life for God, it's because you are not living a life for God. You're living a life for yourself. I've never seen, I've never seen a child who was hungry and their mother say, go make your own food. Mom provides the food for their, for their hunger. And they're satisfied. The worst part of growing up is that mom stops cooking for you. <laughs> you gotta learn to cook yourself. Friends, if your walk with God is a burden, you're not walking for God. You're just walking to try to get to heaven. But the beauty of heaven is not that it's going to be somewhere where one day walk. The beauty of heaven is now. Amen. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is among you now. In other words, the gospel is not that, that one day we're going to have a glorious life. The gospel is that right now you can have a glorious life. What do you say? The gospel is that if you struggle with sin, and if you come to Jesus, He will give you the victory over that sin. We say, Pastor, I've been struggling so long, I'm trying, I'm so tired of failing. Yeah, so am I. You know how many promises I've made to God and broken? You know how many times I've said to God, okay, that's the last time, I promise. That's another lie. You know how many times Jesus has abandoned me? Never. I will be with you even until the end of the age. 
we come to Jesus with the understanding that, God, I can't do anything. I'm tired of making promises. I can't change. I love sinning. Let's just be honest. We love sinning. Amen? Whether your sin is Coors Beers or Marlboros or CBD, whatever it may be, whatever your sin is, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's adultery, whether it's lust, whether it's anger, bitterness, whatever it is, you cannot overcome it without Jesus. I don't know how Jesus does it. I wish I could tell you, brother, do this, do that, and in nine days you'll be fit righteously. I wish I had a video like some of these workout videos. If you do this and eat this, and in five days you'll look like this guy. Doesn't work. As HMS Richard said, I don't know how a black cow eats green grass and gives us yellow butter and white milk. I don't understand it. But it happens. I can't tell you how, how an alcoholic becomes free in Jesus. I can't tell you how an abusive husband learns to love his wife. I can't tell you how a rebellious, a rebellious child comes back to the grace of God. But I know that God does it. Amen? Amen. And I know that because he's done that in my life. If you would have told me 20 years ago that I'd be a pastor, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> if you would have told me 20 days ago that God has a plan for me, sometimes I'd be like, are you sure? Because I'm a sheep of sins. But Jesus says to them, your righteousness has to surpass. They say, but I say. They say, but I say. Listen to what they say, but don't do what they do. Come on to me. All you who are tired and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Thank you, Jesus. I know that some of you are tired this morning. You're tired of praying for victory. You're tired of praying for that loved one that just can't see the beauty of the gospel. But I'm telling you, friends, if you come to Jesus, that rest that he promises to us can be yours today. So I ask you, friends, my appeal to you today, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Then the answer is Jesus. I don't know how, but I guarantee you this. If you put your life in the hands of God, He will answer His promises. Someone says, we pass a hard time paying time. So I'll make you a deal. You pay tithe faithfully for three months. And if in three months the Lord hasn't blessed you, I'll return to you your tithe in cash with 10% interest. Pastor, how, how can you afford that? I can't, I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> but he ain't, amen? Now, I, 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 I'm making these bets knowing that God can provide. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this, this family took it. Her husband was a little hesitant on tithing, and they were always going back and forth. I said, listen, sister, if your husband says no to tithe, you don't tithe. But I'll make you a bet. I'm not a betting man, but this one is guaranteed. So we collected the tithe. We, this is a real story. True story. We didn't deposit it in the bank. It never showed up on our church books. I said, in 30 days, the Lord, in three months, if the Lord doesn't bless you, we'll give it back with interest. What bank will give you interest, 10% in, interest in three months? None. What do you got to lose? So 
the husband is like, bet. <laughs> Bring it. Guess what happened? The Lord blessed. Amen. Worked for 20 years for FedEx. Got laid off years before. And within these three months, they got a check from FedEx that he was not anticipating. From his 401k that he never cashed out. God bless him with a new car. God bless him with this. God bless him with that. Three months went by. I said, Pastor, please keep the money. We never want to see it again. <laughs> because the Lord is faithful. Amen? Amen. What I'm trying to tell you is that God never fails. Yes. And if you hold on to him, hear me now. He will come through. Amen. But you have to be willing to hold on to Jesus. Don't look at what you've done. Don't look at your righteousness because it's filthy. Focus on Jesus. And He'll restore your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much.